so we're going to begin. And a lot of this stuff came about as of the fact that uh, a year or so ago, I was uh, called upon to write Cthulhu Mythos background for Pathfinder. You know, Sandy Peterson's Cthulhu Mythos for Pathfinder. And uh, the book is coming out very shortly. It's going to be about 500 pages long. Of course, a lot of it is Pathfinder stats for the monsters and stuff that you may or may not care about. But there's also background material. Okay, and mostly that's and that's pretty much all I wrote was background material because I don't play Pathfinder. I don't know how their stats work. We had someone else. I said, uh, Shargoths have to do this effect, and then he someone translated it into Pathfinder for me. Right. So let's talk about what we got. So first, and I'm gonna randomly jump around because that's how my mind works or doesn't work. Okay. And one of the questions I get sometimes is. Um, like, what is the name of the star spawn or, or the amigo or that in their own language? And the answer is that they don't have one as we understand it because the old ones, right, the elder things, they communicate by piping noises, right? They, like, they, they squeak or they whistle or they flute. So their name is probably like a five-toned flute chord. It's impossible for the human apparatus to, to do it. They don't have it. And, you know, and similarly, they can't reproduce human speech. They don't have vocal cords. They have the flute thing. So, so they don't have a name comprehensible in ours. We can reproduce it with a recording or something, right? Or, or, a, or a Moog synthesizer. Okay, similarly, the star spawn, they communicate by telepathy. They probably don't have any verbal speech. The statement, uh, Fungui. Uh, uh, is not Cthulhu's language because he doesn't. He has telepathy. He mostly lives in vacuum. There's no sound in vacuum. That language is either the Deep One tongue or it's a language that Cthulhu invented to use with humans. Okay, and if it's the Deep One tongue, as we'll get into in a minute, then that also Cthulhu invented it. And it's probably designed in such a way to have effects on the human brain and psychology when you speak it, which is why he makes his cult to say that phrase all the time. Okay, let's talk about the Migo. You know how they communicate? They change the color of their head. It's light waves. They don't have, that's why they're called Fungi from Yagath or the Migo. They don't have their own language. They use light patterns, okay, or maybe radio waves too. Uh, the Yithians, okay, humans called the planet, original planet Yith, the Yithians that lived in the Mesozoic era clicked claws. One of the things that's really cool about Lovecraft's aliens, and one of the reasons that I originally was attracted to them, is because they're so alien. You know, they aren't, like in Star Trek, a typical alien is a human with a crinkle cut french fry glued to his nose, right? But in Lovecraft's, they aren't, they don't have bones, they're just bizarre, which I love. So there's some things, when, so the question of what, what do they call themselves is, while not meaningless, I mean, in the case of the Migo, it's probably something like uh, uh, this ultraviolet color plus this infrared color plus this green plus, right? It's like these wavelengths are how it describes itself, right? So um, now let's talk about the deep ones. So if you all read much Lovecraft, people here have read Lovecraft stories, okay. If you've read the stories, one of the things Lovecraft does in a number of the stories is he has, <coughs> he gives histories of the world. Okay, Mountains of Badness, they go, they go back and they describe the old one's history on the planet from the time there was the first life, because they created the first life, up till modern times. If you read um, uh, 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 the, the Shadow Out of Time, it gives the history from where the great race first came to Earth and their survival during the Mesozoic and all these things. It talks about wars they fought, how the old ones fought wars against the Migo, uh, the, who apparently used to have a much bigger presence on the planet, how they fought wars against the star spawn when they arrived, things like this. And one of the things that you'll notice in all these tales, some other tales talk about the serpent, is no one ever mentions the deep ones. The deep ones are not talked about in any of these tales, okay? And the next thing to consider about the Deep Ones is that they're really weird. And what I mean is, for example, the Deep Ones are humanoid. They're like the only race that's humanoid. Well, the Serpent Men may be a little bit, but the Serpent Men actually evolved on Earth, right? So it makes sense. The Deep Ones, could they evolve on Earth? Well, their, their reproductive system is so bizarre, they can reproduce with species that they're not related to. Nothing on Earth does that. 
right? The deep ones do that. They can reproduce with dolphins. They can reproduce with the humans. They can probably reproduce with fish. Who knows? So they have, they have a really weird internal biology, but they're shaped kind of like a human, okay? And they don't have any history in Lovecraft's tales. So my conclusion, which I think I can back up, is that the Deep Ones are a modern creation that Cthulhu, I mean, no, when I say modern, could have been five or 10,000 years ago, right? But Cthulhu made the Deep Ones to have a race to communicate with and possibly wipe out humans, right? In fact, if you think about the Deep One reducism, it's like the screw fly. You know about the screw fly? Okay, so there's a, so there's a, there's a fly um, called the screw fly. And what it does is it lays its eggs in, in wounds or sores of sheep. And the maggots grow in there and they cause infections and it kills the sheep and they're really bad. So to get rid of them, they took male screw fries and they irradiated them to make them sterile and they released millions of them in the, in the American South, in like Texas and stuff. And these would mate with the female screw flies, then the females wouldn't lay eggs or they had to sterile eggs because they made it with a sterile male. And screw flies only mate once. And as a result of this, screw flies are now super rare in Texas and they used to be one of the, like a big pest. The deep ones, they can mate with humans and the result is not a human. So, so, the deep, so the deep ones seem to be designed to interact with humans. They're made shaped like a human, even though that makes no sense for something under the sea. I mean, how many things in the water are humanoid, right? Like frogs, maybe? That's about it, and frogs don't sit in the water all the time. So, he's make, so Cthulhu created the deep ones to interact with us. That's maybe why they also even have a vocal language. And it also is why the deep ones in the Shadow of Rinsmith, they totally don't worship Cthulhu, if you notice. They, worship, they have other things going on because they're a manufactured thing of Cthulhu. He doesn't care if they worship him, right? He's not getting power from the deep ones. They're just something he's made to go out there and, uh, and mess with us. So this is my vision of the deep ones. I think I can defend it. Okay, old ones. <coughs> this is just a brief thing. We, we know that the old ones are extinct on Earth. Nonetheless, I use them in my scenarios all the time. And they've heard other things because... The old one, like not every old one has to be on Earth. We know they came from outer space to Earth. And we know from the dreams in the witch house where the hero of the story visits a planet and there's live old ones still there. So the old ones are out there, they're around, they're active. They are from our part of the galaxy because they're made of normal matter. Uh, unlike the fungi. So the fungi from Yagoth. One of the things Lovecraft makes clear in his story is that there are many varieties of the fungi. I don't know if these are the possibly casts, varieties, and that in fact the highest ones, the most important ones, aren't the ones that came to Earth. It's just the ones that came to Earth are very specialized so they can fly here. And they appear to, some of them at least, have been modified surgically so they can talk and communicate with humans because that's not how they don't because like when they're on Yagoth, Pluto or in outer space they obviously don't talk because there's no air they must use light waves so we, we, all, we also know that they are part fungus they look crustaceanish. they are a, a true fungus because earth fungus are not any more related to them than earth crustaceans but I think because of their surgical I think the way that fungi work and they also are non, not our I don't think they breed casts I think they carve them out of masses of fungus they form a, a, a shell on them and then they're active, okay? And they can do things. They do seem to have some kind of core in them because you can shoot one and kill it. And if it was just a, like a solid, like a potato, you couldn't do that. So you can kill them and they don't, but they don't seem to care. Like they aren't upset in the whisper and darkness when they're killed. So I don't think they have any, any personal sense of continuity. You can kill them, they just don't care. I also think that they, another reason they don't care if you kill them is because it's, it's, they probably reproduce by spores or by carbon. So they can just like make more fungi whenever they want. So if they need a fungus that has a specially powerful brain to do something, they just carve it out with a big brain, or, right? Or, or, or inject into it. And they just make them however they want, okay? Um, the, uh, so we have a huge variety of these things that may be one of the reasons they're so successful spreading across the galaxy because they have made it from a part of the galaxy or a part of the universe where the natural laws are different to ours, which the old ones did not. The old ones may have originated in our 
in the Milky Way. The fungi didn't. They said they've come across interstellar space or intergalactic space. Um, it's the, uh, we can talk about the brain cases. This is just an extension of what they do with themselves. In a sense, all the fungi are, are their own brain case. They have simply taken a fungi brain or some of the matter and put it in a body. And that's, that's this creature. And you have wings so you can fly through space and you can get to Earth, right? And they don't seem to die naturally, they just go eternally. Um, so making a human brain case is just a variant in that. We know that they can take the human brain case and plug it into speech machines and seeing machines and hearing machines. The, uh, I have a scenario written in which they plug it into other kinds of machines, like work machines and devices. I see no reason they couldn't do that. I don't think they need humans to do that because they could just put a fungus brain in it too, right? They may have huge earth movers on Pluto that have a fungus brain in them and this giant, you know, thousand foot long body because why not do that? And you can if you're, if you're an amigo. So they have a huge industry of this and it's rather fortunate they only have a few on earth right now because they've lost i guess they've lost some interest in earth um uh, oh yes one more thing the brain case the brain case is described as being very simple okay therefore it's my belief that the technology in the meagle brain cylinder isn't the the casing it's the liquid inside that's what keeps the brain alive and undying and probably even like 1930s American human technology could make the cylinders just something to hold the, the liquid in. And a little wiring for the plugs. So there's there's that. Um, like I said, this is a big brain dump thing. Ah, yes, so we know that when the Migo are killed, they melt away. Okay, and we know that when Wilbur Waitley was killed, he melts away. May indicate there's some connection between them. The question is, why do they melt away? What makes them melt? Okay, humans melt away after death because we're rotted by bacteria. It's probably not happening in this case because it's too fast. So the indication is that when they're alive, something's holding them together. Okay, magnetic fields, the force of their mind, some energy we don't understand is keeping them going. And when they die and that function stops, the cohesion goes away, which also indicates that the fungi Without, without that force on them, like they might be mostly liquid because of the, right? And, and they maybe they use that to maneuver and control themselves. And then when the, when the cohesion stops keeping the liquid maintained, they go out, they go out. So if you think of the fungi as a liquid creature held in a, in a, in a hard crust with uh, things controlling it, it suddenly becomes a lot more alien. And you understand why the old ones had trouble battling with them, because the older were saying they had trouble fighting with Migo. One of the problems was to leave Migo in space, but, but, but a human in Whisper and Darkness shoots Migo and kills them. So like, the old ones could do that, right? Why, why is there a trouble? The problem, the trouble probably isn't with killing individual Migo, it's with the numbers of them, the, the fact that they can make new things immediately, they can make these giant creatures if they want, just carving them out. So that's, that's the Migo thing. Okay, moving on, because I'm trying to, the brain that thing. Let's talk about Haster. Here's my perception of Haster. I've done a lot of looking about it. We know that Haster shows up and this kind of thing. How can Haster hear you say his name? Okay. Here is my belief. My belief is that Haster doesn't obey his laws of perspective. Let me give you an example. Let us say that Haster is, is uh, 10 miles that way. We're looking there and we see, you know when someone's far away, like right now, I can put my hand here on, you're Clinton, right? Yeah. I can put my hand like here over your head, see? And then I can go like this, but I can't actually squish his head. His head looks about this big to me, okay? But I think if you see Haster far away, you put your hand on it, you can feel his head because he's not there. He's right here, just small by perspective because he's everywhere with the line of sight to him, okay? So when he is on Alderaan and Hyades, he's super tiny because he's so far away, but he's also right here physically present because he's not obeying those laws of perspective, which means that when Haster appears, say Haster appeared in this room, we would all see him from a different perspective. Each of us would have our own Haster to deal with. And if I did something to eliminate my Haster, it wouldn't eliminate yours. He's still there. You know, you can feel a bit of difference. He's there always. He's omnipresent. That's how he, when you hear his, when he hears his name, he can show up because he's there with you. 
you know, maybe sometimes he doesn't show up because the planets turn the other way around from his, but maybe even then he can go through the planet. So I believe this is how Haster operates. You know, there, we know that a lot of these things don't obey our natural, it makes no sense with our natural laws, but these things are, we're repeatedly told don't obey our natural laws, but other, other rules. So that's a twist on him that I think is effective and poss possibly fun in the game. You know, that means if Haster appears to a whole army of people, everyone in the army gets their own Haster to deal with, which makes, which is one of the reasons he's so terrible to, to, to work with. Okay, Haster. Okay, um, let's talk about tech. Uh, this is a very fast brain, Sandy Peterson brain dump. Technology, okay? Now, one of the things I get talk, I, I ask about a lot is, um, well, well, humans have this technology. We can make any kind of technology we want. If we get more advanced in the future, we'll have better technology, and maybe then we can have like real ones. Well, I think from the viewpoint of the races of the mythos, technology is totally a crutch. You don't need spaceships if you can plunge from planet to planet through the world. You don't need ray guns if you have the ability to focus and control energy of any magnitude with your mind or with your, your body's organs. You don't need medicine if you live eternally. And you can regenerate. You don't, right? So let me give an example. Okay, uh, we have technology to enable someone to move around if their legs are crippled. We call it a wheelchair. None of you were in a wheelchair, okay, because you don't need it. To the great old ones, humans in a spaceship or with a giant robot or with a ray gun are are like a guy in a wheelchair using that crutch. I think that Cthulhu and the old ones and they all understand the technology. They know exactly how it works. They can build anything they want. They just don't need it. You don't need a computer if you can maintain all the knowledge in your head all the time, like the fungi. It's always there, available for them. You know, or if you're telepathic for your whole species. So, so you know, Lovecraft races understand about tech. They don't always use it. Some of them do use it. We know that the old ones use it to a limited extent. We know that the great race uses it. So they do. They understand it. They can pull it out when they need. The, uh, the fungi use a sort of tech. They use a lot of biological stuff and some physical things. So, but these are like the lesser races. I don't think Cthulhu uses tech because he, everything technology would do, he can already do, you know, to a, like technology can let us channel cosmic energy, but he already does that, you know? So I think that we can, technology is our crutch. I think we need it. And we focus a lot on it because we need it so much, you know? And so there it is, okay. Okay, moving on a little more. Um, hunting horrors have been a problem in the past because people because one of the things we know about hunting horrors is they are destroyed by the light, right? The uh, the light wipes them out. But also they're supposed to fly through space. So like, if they're flying through space, how does the sun not? If they're going from from Mars to Earth. Why doesn't the sun make them go away? If when they're on Earth, the sun can make them go away. What's going on here? Well, it's my belief that there is only one hunting horror and that it's a multi-dimensional creature. And each of the instances of what we see are like the fingers of a fourth dimensional thing reaching into the third dimension. So there's different, looks like different entities. So it's just here. It's not, you know, and that one's destroyed. It withdraws from our realm. You know, if you get like, if you're, if you're a 3D thing going to a 2D area, you put your finger into the pool and they can see your finger. If they bite it, you can pull it back out and that hunting horse seems to be gone, but there's, but this multidimensional thing with, you know, with billions of organs can, can come back down and appear. And that's the avoidance of the, uh, of the sunlight, just popping in and out, okay? Or moving through space. Okay, um, or possibly displaying a part of the creature when it's flying through space that is not vulnerable to light, you know, like a knuckle, and then it comes out. Finally, I'm going to describe what happens when Cthulhu rises from the deeps, okay? There's stages of it as it builds up in power and Cthulhu's reality starts to manifest. So there's three parts of this to discuss. rising from the depths. And this is why, by the way, that you can't just, you won't nuking Cthulhu or making a giant robot fight Cthulhu won't, won't save the day. Okay, so first, let's talk about his telepathy. 
It starts out, remember, he has telepathy. And even when he's asleep and dreaming, sensitive people can pick up on it. Okay? His cultists, artists, maybe other people just have nightmares. When he starts coming up, that telepathy becomes stronger until you are constantly hearing Cthulhu's exhortations and needs in your mind. Okay, it builds up until maybe all you can have in your mind is Cthulhu's mental waves. Now, perhaps if we were a stronger species like the old ones, we could, we could, we could block out Cthulhu's sendings, or at least be able to still maintain ourselves. I'm not sure humans can do that as effectively. When he's fully risen from the deep, this telepathy is, I mean, his telepathy hits everyone on Earth. So, so everyone is getting Cthulhu's waves. Some people will go insane from it. Some people will worship him. Some people may be able to resist it, but it's, but it's all over the world. People in New York and, and Moscow and everywhere are like getting the mental waves and unable to react as he gets stronger. So right there makes it obviously hard to handle Cthulhu. If you're sending in your airplanes for a strike on Cthulhu and half the pilots go insane or are ejecting or crashing planes into each other, right there, there's issues. So, telepathy. I mean, I know you don't, you, you don't need assistance to know how bad Cthulhu is, but you may have thought about how bad he was. So let's go to the second part. Geometry. On the island, when the people are going to wake up Cthulhu, everything is fine. When they're running away from Cthulhu, they seem to have trouble getting to the boat, and at least one guy falls into an angle and swallows him up. I think that Cthulhu spreads his geometry around him as he grows. And initially, I think it's like when you're in a dream and you're trying to get away and it's further, hard to get away and slow moving. You're seeing, so I think in, when he first comes up, moving away from Cthulhu t is a longer distance than moving towards him. As it, as it proliferates, the angles start to appear that you can fall into or fall out of. And maybe the angles are such that when you're running away from Cthulhu, you only go in circles like a pocket universe back to him because he's got the area controlled. Ultimately, the angles and the geometry become such we don't even fall through it. That means things can go the other way and now things start coming out through the angles everywhere. And not just on his island, but like in the schloss, there'd be things cracking through the walls and the geometry would make sense and that door is not always there. And this is one of the effects of Cthulhu being out in full force, at least near him, that all of the jump changes. One more thing about Cthulhu. We know that Cthulhu is simply one representative of his, of his species. We'll talk about that. And by the way, we don't have any evidence that the guy that appears at the end of the story to call Cthulhu is Cthulhu. The person that calls him Cthulhu is the narrator who doesn't who wasn't there. It could have just been a star spawn. Just. Because Cthulhu is in a sense just a star spawn. Now he's it says he is the high priest and ruler of the star spawn. So he's a really important star spawn. I mean, he might be the biggest, but it doesn't guarantee that. But, but when, when Rolia rises from the deep, it's not just Cthulhu killing everyone. It is, as he puts, as he mentions, that there's millions of star spawn, the size and power of Cthulhu rising from the deep. So it's not just Godzilla coming to your town. It's millions of Godzillas that change geometry and communicate with you telepathically and regenerate from, and so it's, so that's why Cthulhu is the game over, which is why in Cthulhu Wars, um, well, I'll talk a little about Cthulhu Wars just for a second because it's sort of the psychology behind it. So in 1981, I designed the game Call of Cthulhu, which probably some of you have played. In this game, I set up the fundamental dialectic of investigators against the mythos, right? Those of you who play Cthulhu Wars know what I'm talking about. You are heroic investigators. You must stop the Cthulhu mythos. Every, almost every single Cthulhu game since then, Elder Sign, Alone Against the Dark, um, Cthulhu Gumshoe, uh, Arkham Horror, uh, Eldritch Horror, all of them have that exact same story. Investigators against the mythos. No one changed it from what I originally put in there. Okay, which is fine. It's a great story. When I did Cthulhu Wars, I didn't want to tell that story again. 
and all, not because it was a bad one. I just like, I'd done it. I, I, everything I had to say about investigators worth the mythos, I'd done in, in that. So I have something new. And the other thing is that one of the things you never see in these other games, including Call of Cthulhu, is Cthulhu rising from the deep with all this crap. Because if Cthulhu rises from the deep, the game, like, the, that's the end of the game, right? You, you, like, you don't play past that point. Because Cthulhu rolls up, I guess we'll start a new campaign, you know? So, in, so, but I wanted to see that. I wanted to see the mountains of protoplasm rising from the deep. I wanted to see him scouring areas free of life. I wanted to have the telepathy blanketing everyone. I wanted to have all that stuff. So the only way I could do that, I actually have done some Call of Cthulhu campaigns set in that universe, like the post-apocalyptic Cthulhu, where, where people wake up and Cthulhu now rules the world. Uh, and if you want to read a book that is effectively that universe, I recommend The Nightland by William Hope Hodgson, which uh, is essentially when the great old ones come back and conquer the world, there's a few humans left, written in like 1910, Lovecraft loved it, so it's not coincidence that it, that uh, his his future universe is based on that. It's so far in the future in the Nightland that the sun's gone out. That's why it's the Nightland. The sun, there's no sun. Humans all live in this big pyramid, and and it's surrounded by things from outside waiting to break in. They have, they have the earth power left to hold them off for a while, but eventually it'll give out. So, uh, and what happens in the story is all the humans are in this one big pyramid. They think, and this one guy in the pyramid. He has an ability called the night hearing, which is like telepathy. And he picks up messages from a woman who's in another smaller pyramid. And their pyramid's earth power is almost out. They're just about to go down. So he falls in love with her via the night hearing. And, he tr and then the story is he travels across the nightland to get to her and find her and, and bring her back. And that's the story. And he has this super armor and his weapon is like a, a, a cross between a lightsaber and a chainsaw. And uh, even with that, the things they're fighting are so terrifying that he almost can't handle it. And they aren't human. It's like one of the most creepy things is the House of Silence, which is a house that sits there. And the one thing it does in the story is at one point it puts on a light in the window. And, like, and it is so scary. It's a great story. Anyway, the Nightland. So, Cthulhu Wars, I said, I'm going to have Cthulhu come back. He's going to have all this stuff. It's going to be awesome. But who can fight him? Well, the humans can't. And that's why in Cthulhu Wars... You know, you are the other great old ones. And one of my f features in this, and I'll talk about this more in my game design thing, is that I wanted to have a game where all the players felt like they were overpowered screws that nobody could beat. And if you can just get your act together and get all your powers going and get your, your, your victory machine working, nothing can stop you. And I think that if you've played Cthulhu Wars, that's exactly how you feel. Uh, of course, sometimes someone else gets their victory machine going earlier but uh, that's how it goes. Uh, let's see. What else do I have here about Secrets of the Mythos? Ah, yes. I, I, I barreled through what I was hoping to, to cover. Some of the, there's so much stuff we could go here. We can go and talk about the Ithians all day, right? And the mystery of the Ithians, which, so let's talk about the mystery of the Ithians. So, you know how the Ithians work? They exterminate entire species to keep themselves going. And they do it by mass transferring their minds into the bodies of the new species. So far, so good, right? But the bodies are that new species' bodies. So, for example, let us say that a Yithian took you over. So your mind is now a Yithian's. But your body is still yours. Then you have a baby. What's the baby? Is it not a human? Why would I have a Yithian mind? So if the Yithians take over your species, and then the, that species has children, like, are those Yithians? Aren't they their own species? This may explain why the Yithians only take over races that they think are of the mental ability to handle their culture. I think the Yithians, has anyone here seen the movie Quatermass in the Pit? No one? You haven't seen it? Okay, in the movie Quatermass in the Pit, which I strongly recommend, by the way, um, they find out that human, that what happened is that millions of years ago, Mars was dying out. Just like it did not, I mean, there used, used to be life on, but maybe not life. There was running water on Mars, we know, right? So the Martians are dying out, so they want to continue their culture. They can't live on Earth. 
because they're Martian. They come to Earth and they find primitive ape things. And they basically engineer them to become intelligent and become humans. And the goal of the Martians is they will carry on the Martian culture. And in the story, they wake up a Martian spaceship from millions of years ago and it realizes that we have failed them. We are not carrying on the culture properly. We have not been purging our society of deviants enough. And so like everything goes to hell and right? we haven't maintained our psychic abilities. So the Martians are, so anyway, it's bad in the story, right? But so it's possible, one possibility is that the Indians, like <coughs> they take over races with giant brains and many abilities so that that race, so that the kids will be taught by the Indians, have the Indian culture, the Indian ethos can handle the Indian technology and carry it on. So they don't want humans because our kids can't manage the Indian stuff. Right? When Ethian's mind in us is in us, they can, but the human, our kids will never do it. So they got to pass the humans, go on to the beetles. And I think, the, I, by the way, I think that the be we know they have beetles after us. I think that the advantage of the beetles for the Ithians, I don't think it's a gi one giant beetle they inhabit. I think they are in swarms of beetles. And that the beetle swarm as a whole, like, is, is like a gestalt that keeps the Ithian main going. It's also useful for the Ithians because, of course, if a beetle dies, New beetles can be like you, you never you're effectively immortal once you're in a just off, right? So anyway, the Ithian problem. It's also possible, sometimes I talk about the idea that maybe maybe the soul is something more important to Ithians. Usually love cards are not a soul, right? Not exactly, it's only a mind. So maybe the Ithians have some other way of making sure that the minds of the children are Ithian minds. But the culture thing is this real possibility. Alright, we uh, have still some time. And I've been jabbering on like a hammerhead for a while. So now I am open to questions. Ask me anything. And I will attempt to make a clever or useful answer. One of the things you always talk about when we meet Sandy is your vision of Cthulhu, how you wanted it to do in the beginning, and how you see Lovecraft being a modern author. I think that's an Oh, OK. This is, this is more about Call of Cthulhu. OK. So, uh, uh, a while ago, I was in Poland and at uh, a convention, and and the people asked me. Um, one of them asked me a question about, like, how do you stop players from wanting to play Cthulhu in the modern age? And I said, I would never do it. I, I never play Cthulhu in the 1920s. I always play in the modern times. And they were all right, but that violates the whole thing of Call of Cthulhu. And I said, look, here is the deal with Call of Cthulhu in the 1920s. When I was doing Call of Cthulhu originally. If you read a lot of our stories, it's not full of quaint uh, information about the 1920s. Okay, Lovecraft is writing stories that are as modern as he can make them. They have airplane exploration of the Antarctic. They have submarines. They have ultraviolet ra rays. He has the discovery of astronomical. He's trying to have everything be cutting edge stuff. He is not trying to exult in his age. Okay. Now, if you read Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan, Arthur Conan Doyle. He is a Dalton in his age. There's tons of stuff about 1980s London, 1880s London, because he loves that milieu. Lovecraft isn't interested in that milieu. He's interested in like time, but the future. So to Lovecraft, if he wrote today, there's absolutely no doubt that it would be set in 2017 with whatever discoveries we have now. That's what he likes. Now, Chaosium, um, back in the day when I did Lovecraft, like many people, they thought that Lovecraft was a horrible hack. And they didn't read him and they didn't respect him. They knew I was, they were smart enough to know they needed someone that liked Lovecraft to write the, the game, which is why they got me. But the, and they were also, which a lot of people wouldn't have done. They would have just done it and made fun of it, right? Kind of like, you know, Batman uh, Returns when they got someone that didn't really love Batman to do the movie and he, just, and he made it a mockery, right? So. Uh, but they also knew that they needed something about Cthulhu, Call of Cthulhu, that they could like so they could probably support it, that they could kind of hang their mental hat on to enjoy Call of Cthulhu. And for them, that was the 1920s. So they put together the 1920 source book, they got super focused on the 1920s, and I didn't care, right? I said, I can still play it whenever I want. And so that, the 1920s thing in Call of Cthulhu was totally for Chaosium of the time. This is not the same as modern Chaosium, right? This is the old Chaosium. Something that they could like about Lovecraft, because they didn't like the stories. They learned to like the stories over time, but by then they were stuck in the 20s. So when I play it, now I do play games that are not set 
in the modern age. Um, but I said, I said, hey, I have a game I run set in 1946 Japan. I have games I run set in the distant future. I have games I run out of the past. I set them anywhere, right? The one I'm running today is set in 2017. Um, <clears throat> in Germany, actually. Garz is a real town. And you, if anyone's from Garz, I apologize for saying that your town is full of, of Satanists and, and, uh, and uh, neo Nazis and meth heads. But I did it in a town like that, so there it is. Um, <clears throat> so. I think Lovecraft wanted it in, in the modern era. And there's advantages of playing in the modern era when you're playing Call of Cthulhu. One is you don't have to explain anything. Okay? You can say the guy drives up in a uh, in a Ferrari and people and, and the players will go, oh, he must be rich. Okay? Whereas if I say he drives up in you know a local mobile. In the 20s, you have no idea what that means. And he says, oh yeah, that means he is, right? You don't know what it means, right? When you're trying to get somewhere, you know how to get there. You don't have to take the elevated train or something bizarre. Everything is clear. <coughs> the laws are understandable. Um, players can make their own internal reference. I find that really useful because, because the extra burden of understanding the 20s, to me, can set up a barrier between you and the horror, which is what I care about. Now, some people like that milieu because that's fun in its own right for them. And that's nothing wrong with that, okay? But to me, I'm trying to get at the, at the horror, so. And horror can be any age, you know that about it? There's a, there's, a, there's a fine zombie movie called Exit Humanity set just after the American Civil War, and it's fabulous. But, and, uh, but it doesn't exult in the culture of the American Civil War, it's like, this is the time period. So one of the great things is they have the mad scientist you have in zombie movies trying to figure out a cure. But he's like a Civil War doctor. He's like, he can do amputations. You know, he can't really fix the zombies because how can you? And he knows it, so he's like drunk all the time. Anyway, so there's my answer to modern age Cthulhu. I play it in the modern age, or, I, or if I do it somewhere else, I do it with simple medium. You can do it however you want, but that is my argument in favor of the modern age. And now we can go on to the next question for which we have eight minutes. No questions of Secrets of the Clue Mythos? Um, there's one topic in my mind, and it's about politics. Okay. The uh, concept of politics is uh, kind of irrelevant in relation to cosmic horror. But do you have political horror in your games, and what's your take on the subject of <clears throat> political horror? I think in the modern world there has been a really bad trend towards people trying to make art political because politics are so important to them, their movie must be political, their paintings must be political, their clothing design must be political. And the fact is, I don't think it does need to be. I think that I can really love a main boss from the 1500s without being horrified by the main dynasties uh, rules, which I don't care for. The, the, the vase is still fabulous. I think I can enjoy looking at um, Art Deco things from the, uh, the, the 1920s without having to worry about whether Aubrey Beardsley was weird in his politics. And I think that someday people will look back on our movies and on our art and on our games and our items and they won't care what our politics are because what the, right? Because their politics will be so different, it won't matter. You know, so we, so if we want art that speaks further down the years than tomorrow, we need to not focus on this political thing. This is prime. This is. Uh, it started out as a trend among totalitarian governments, the, the 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 fascist and communist alike, because everything had to be political for them because they had to control every aspect. But but and and now that the um, the the the, the the evil right wing is mostly shattered into a million pieces. There's not like a monolithic thing. But the evil left wing still is monolithic in general. Okay, I'm not saying that they're more evil. But they still have this thing of art must be political. We must make a point. But unless it's also good art, the point to me is immaterial. So that's my feeling about politics and art. Thank you. And I think I will talk a little bit about Lovecraft's racism. People often will ask me something along the lines of, well, Lovecraft was kind of a racist. I said, yeah, Lovecraft was kind of a racist. Okay, absolutely. It's not really that solidly in his stories. 
Okay, I mean, he's anti, he's famously anti-Semitic, but he married a Jewish girl. So I don't know how anti-Semitic was he. And also a lot of the forum where we see Lovecraft's racism is his letters, which is the equivalent of like social media today. And we all know that when you post on social media, you sound way crazier <laughs> than in real life. But here's my answer to the people that say Lovecraft was whatever bad thing they want them to be. My answer is this. <clears throat> if you can tell me that if you were born in 1890 in New England, you would have the same social and political attitude you have today, then you can say Lovecraft was bad. But I don't think you can say that. I think Lovecraft was where he was, when he was, and yet his mind grew beyond that. He, like, what kind of racist calls a echinoderm from the stars, by God, they were men. Right? So, right? So there's, so that's my feeling. You have to look where, the, where they were. Okay? You can find things that say Lincoln was a racist, but he still freed the slaves and did great things. So you look at where they're born. You know, people will be looking back at you where you were born and say, what weird ideas you have. Why didn't you give proper attention to this thing that we now care about 100 years from now? You know, so there it is. And the other important thing about Lovecraft's reason, he never did anything to hurt a person of another race, right? He was not oppressing anyone in his whole life. So I think you have to look at deeds. And one of the problems with the modern age, I think, is that we focus a little too much on what we think someone thinks instead of what they're actually doing. I think deeds are what matter. And I think that if you believe in God and one day you're standing before God's judgment seat, that's what he's going to call you out on, what you did. If you don't believe in God, then, then all that matters is what you did. So either way, it's what you did. Okay, any other questions? Uh, just to conclude this question, uh, what's your idea about Hutu for president? You know, oh, oh, that was funny in like 1980 uh, or, or 1988, and I think, the, I think it's like gotten pretty old. <laughs> I'm kind of like, yeah. it's time to move on. Can't they have like the Oxford for president or something? But, uh, so, to me, the joke is old, yeah. right? Anyway, uh, you guys badly need someone to replace Angela Merkel, so may I suggest that instead of Cthulhu for president? Angela Merkel. Cthulhu is... President. Well, is Kansa, president? Uh, Bundeskanzler. Chancellor. I mean, it's not like Cthulhu, I mean, Cthulhu is not really an American citizen, right? So... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he might qualify for, for Germany, I don't know, we'll see. Let's just say that and, and he would be a strong leader. <laughs> With the so you say, the joke was pressed when I was twelve, so it left an impression on me. Yeah, the tool for president joke was very pressed when I was twelve. It was great then. I mean but we're still doing it, Can't, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> I guess I guess every year mm -hmm. they get like they can get more cash out of it. And frankly, in the last election, Cthulhu was looking pretty good as an alternative to what we had. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, we had we had like 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 a, like a guy that was literally insane and Grandma Hitler as our choices, right? So, <laughs> okay. So, any other questions before we we break up? Because we got someone coming after us, Please. and I'm not going to take extra time, like. No more questions? Thanks, I'm going to pick someone to have a question. I'm going to pick you. Um, give me a question. Say <laughs> You have to give me a question. Then we'll be done. Remember, I used to be a, a college professor. So, so <laughs> I, I'm entitled to do this kind of thing. How do you translate? You, earlier you said you are all about the forest when you are telling your story. You don't care. What here on, don't care. Just don't if care. the Just era makes it scarier, that's good. At the table. Um, it is easy to have the characters being frightened. Yes. But as a DM stand, standpoint, how do you make it's harder the players? It's, it's much harder to frighten the player. Okay? The, the, uh, and, and I can't always pull it off. No one can, right? But what I can do is not, is, is have the game be straight. Have you looked at or played Cthulhu Wars? No? 
No, okay. no. It's all straight. There's a lot of jokey Cthulhu games out there where there's humor elements. Cthulhu Wars is not one of them. Now, when you're playing Cthulhu Wars, it's like it's pretty lighthearted. There's laughing and smack talking and joking going on, but the game is all played straight, and that's what I do in in uh, in Cthulhu. I play the horror straight, and the better I can, the, the more I can stick to that. It's also harder to do in an environment like like a convention where there's other people talking around you and stuff. I can pull. Up, I'm more likely to do it in like a closed thing. Uh, in fact, and rather than me saying how I do, I do it most by instinct, so it's hard to explain. So I'm going to have Fabian partly answer this question. Fabian, 2006. June 6th, I ran a game for you. Yes. And it looked like some of you guys were scared. Yeah, we, we always well, did how that. did I do it? Um, it was just, I mean, it was like the whole setup. But first of all, you don't help that much. So you're just in the I'm not a helpful GM. Yeah, so, so you kind of end up in, in, in these weird situations where you just imagine yourself being in with the characters. And it's, it's like a, the most scariest thing that you did that I played in was the voice on the phone. Ah. Where, where you did this. Because you're totally annoyed by horror movies or being cheap tricks by elim eliminating modern communications and having people in the wilderness. Is it, why are they struggling so much? With I phones? hate the fact that every modern movie, the first thing they do is get rid of your cell phone. Oh, yeah. there's no signal, so the monsters can get me. Yeah. So on this so, one... Okay, so then you said out to write a scenario exactly where the mobile com the communication aspect of it was centerpiece. So we were in that game, and every time you, you picked up the phone and tried to do something or talk to someone, you had that voice on the phone was talking to you, and we couldn't quite figure out it was really spooky because we were really limited in what we could do in the thing, right? Because we wanted to have, you know, it was a modern day setting, we would try to figure out what was going on. And I think, what was it set in New York or something even? Yeah. It was like, a, and every time you picked up the phone, there was like this, you on the phone, right? Like, Hello? It was always this thing, <laughs> you, and we couldn't figure out what yeah, to do. And then I think, like, if you imagine yourself in that, uh, because you can relate to the modern time, you can relate to the character you're playing, and then you imagine, just a little bit imagining that would really happen, that, that is really scary. Because, you know, yeah, and it's internal it. in your head. That's my secret. I guess I'll, I'll go on. It's, it's what happens inside the players' heads that makes them scared. I can say, there's lots of blood and gore, but that's not scary necessarily. So, for example, in the game that he was playing, that I talked about originally, June 6, 2006, what happened is they're playing the game and the dead are rising and there's trouble, and they gradually, and the things are happening around the world, and they keep getting news reports on earthquakes in Japan and, 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 and stuff. And then they gradually realize what the date is. And they kept saying, when does this happen? They said, it's happening today, on this day. And then they realize, wait, it's June 6, 2006. It's 666. And when the players realized that, they suddenly, like, their eyes got big. They were like, holy crap, it's the end of the world. It's today. And then, and then that was creepy. Another example, we had a, a, a one last before we go of how I got that mental horror to go on. There was they, they, th there was this pl house that had a, that was like, had cracks to another dimension in it. So things would come through. And eventually what happened is things started coming through that were modified, that, that were trying to pass for human, but they weren't very successful. Like they could only walk in straight lines sometimes, or there was wires coming out of there, or they, were, they weren't, or they were like, they were hollow inside, okay? With, with some kind of hot liquid. Okay, and, and, and eventually they, they kept getting better, okay? And then one day they, they, they like caught one, and it was actually a pretty good copy. But, I mean, they could tell. And they said, hey, let's test all the players to make sure all of us are human. And they say, yeah, that's a good idea. So the, the easy way, since these things are hollow, they stick a needle in them to see if they have blood. So one of the players, they stuck the needle in the player, and I said, well, I mean, you don't, you don't have blood. You're a replacement. And he goes, what do you mean a replacement? I said, yeah, I says, well, didn't I know her? I said, no, they're, they're, they've gotten so good that they're making replicas that don't know the replicas. Isn't that awesome? He's like, no, I want to be my character. I said, well, this is you. This is the only you you know about. They go upstairs, and they break into a closet, and they find the real him tied up in the closet. They say, <laughs> oh, I want to be that guy now. Well, you can't transfer your mind. You're still you. And so he was like, no. Yeah. And he was, also, also, he was really horrified by that. Also, every time you do something scary, you beat <laughs> okay, one more, one more item. So the players are all walking up the road. With, they, there's something bad in the castle. Okay, they're all walking up the road with the village. They got everyone in the village to come with them. They got torches and pitchfork things. It's just like a Frankenstein movie. And they're marching up, and it's a dark and stormy night, and lightning flashes. And then I take the player aside and say, when the lightning flashes, you can see that during the flash, 
the villagers' faces are not human. And they go, wait. And they're like, but they're here with us. I said, yep. And so I talked to each other and says, are the villagers not human? And we didn't know it. Do the villagers know they're not human? Do the, are the villagers, is this a trap? Have they always not been human? And, and, the, and the whole, that was the end of the session for the night. Because the players could only focus on, we need to get away from them without them knowing. And, they, and, like, and they were terrified because of stuff that was going on inside their heads and questions they had. And so that was... That was a successful and game. There's right? also live humor sort of to it sometimes. It was, well, if you think about it afterwards, it sounds pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, and like the way you can mix that is kind of funny. You remember when, when we had that one scenario where we fig basically figured out that this uh, pharmaceutical company was run by Dracula? Yes. Yes. It was, it, was a, it was a blood firm. And then. And Dracula was in charge. Yeah, and we were <laughs> writing faxes to the secretary of the company, and said he was just writing faxes to us back. Well, yeah, Daniel yeah. walked into Dracula's yeah, office. In, in the end, you know, we were there and in the office, and oh, you can go in now. And the secretary. So, so the secretary said, uh, Mr. He had a different name, right? But we knew yeah. Mr. Sheppish will see you now. And then, so, and then like, but he knew it was Dracula. Yeah, and one of our guys had to decide, like, are you going in? Because we wanted to have an audience. And he says, and Sam just said, you really want to walk into Dracula's office? You know? And he says, so he walks in, and, and the room is a dirt floor with a coffin in the corner. That's all it is, right? It's Dracula's office. And then, like, he doesn't see Dracula first. Then Dracula appears, drifting across. You know, it was like... And he, and he shot himself, basically. Yeah. Well, he shot Dracula a bunch, and I said, yeah, that, why yeah. are you shooting Dracula? And he's, uh, I, I, haven't you ever seen a vampire movie? <laughs> you know, it's like... But anyway, so that was... That is some examples of how to do horror. I hope it's useful. And thank you for listening.